gifts. It doesn't matter where you come from. We like to give them to the people we love and it's always nice to receive some as well. But our cultural background decides how we deal with it. My father is from Egypt and my mother is from the Netherlands. According to the Egyptian culture, I'll show appreciation and open the present once all the visitors are gone. After all, I don't want to look greedy and it's not about a gift but a gesture. Here in the Netherlands, it's the opposite. The giver has put effort into finding the perfect gift for me and is curious about how I will respond. So, the polite thing to do is open it up straight away. With our platform FarmOffer, we are active in more than 200 countries. When I arrive in the morning at the office, I talk with clients from India and China. During the day, most activity comes from European companies and in the afternoon, Latin America and the States start to wake up. I like working in this international pharma environment and different cultures have always interested me. I wanted to learn more about the different business cultures and found this fascinating book, The Culture Map by Erin Mayer. In this book, she describes eight dimensions to understand how cultural differences affect the international business world. And we're going to show how your country performs based on these spectrums. A great tool, especially if you work with different cultures. And that's why I'm going to summarize and explain her findings in this video. Everyone working in the pharmaceutical industry knows it's actually a very small world, but very globalized too. It's great to see all these different cultures come together from every corner in the world at pharma exhibitions like the CPHI. It is useful to have a good grasp on those cultural differences, to stay on top of your game and, more importantly, not to unintentionally offend clients, partners or even your colleagues. But the reality is that the large majority of professionals who work in the international business world have limited understanding about the ways culture is affecting their work, according to Erin Meyer. In this new explainer video, we'll dive deeper into these eight dimensions, which I personally find really interesting and I hope you guys will enjoy it as much as I did. So let's go. We don't want you to be overwhelmed by too much information, so we divided this video into two parts. The first, communication is key. So the first dimension of how Aaron Mayer describes cultural differences is low versus high context cultures. Countries with low context culture prefer a precise, simple and clear communication style, while high context culture prefer a more layered and nuanced one. For example, let's say that as the manager of the quality department, you ask for an important SOP to be finished by Friday at the latest. In general, Americans will hear that the deadline is on Friday, while Japanese might send some stress in your tone and message and finish the report at the earliest, thinking that it might be urgent and the essence of your request. Let's take a look at how countries score on the communication scale. The United States is the lowest context culture in the world. On the other side of the scale, we find Japan, which is the country with the most high context culture and voila, all countries in between. The more low context the culture, the more people are likely to put everything in writing or contracts. In high context cultures like China or India, it's not always necessary to spell out certain messages too explicitly. It can even be perceived as inappropriate to do so. Many high context cultures, particularly those of Asia and Africa, have a strong oral tradition written documentation seems less necessary in their eyes. So don't be too shocked when you receive very short replies but long calls from Asian companies. Let's go to the second dimension, feedback. I think you should be able to do the job in half the time you're used to do it right now. This is an example of direct negative feedback. The opposite, indirect negative feedback sounds more like you did a great job and the deadline was met, but we could try to save some time to be more efficient next time. Russians, Dutch and Germans are particularly big fan of offering honest criticism. It is remarkable that American culture is way more nuanced compared with the low and high context scale. You'll find them in the middle of the scale. The British are close, but are slightly less direct with negative feedback than Americans. Asian countries like India and China prefer their criticism softer. 
Giving feedback, especially when it's negative, is a sensitive topic. Not everyone takes criticism well. It can even be worse if the person receiving the feedback thinks it's rude. Countries with a direct negative feedback culture provide feedback in a straightforward and honest manner. On the other hand, countries with an indirect negative feedback culture provide feedback in a softer and more diplomatic way. Criticism is given in private, while in direct negative cultures it's normal for it to be given in front of people. For instance here in the Netherlands, it is always best to express your opinion directly. If you have some negative feedback, you don't really need to sugarcoat it. However, if you work mainly for or with Asian cultures, it might be better to think twice and reformulate before giving your feedback. You wouldn't want to offend your colleagues, right? So, number three, the art of persuasion. Let's take Farmover as an example. On a regular basis, we need to convince medicine makers to use our platform, suppliers to market and sell their APIs, don't forget investors, partners, government, etc. As you can see, the list goes on and on, and without good persuasion skills, life is simply harder. There are generally two types of reasoning, principle first reasoning or applications first reasoning. So let's say we give a presentation about our company. Principle first approach would be to start our presentation with theoretical arguments like the size of the API market, the problem that companies face, the impact of the problem to patients, then we start talking about our solution and the product. To application first thinkers, you need to get to the point quickly and give examples. It would be something like, imagine one place where medicine makers can find all API suppliers in the world, including all information necessary to make decisions. Our clients are quite satisfied that they are no longer dependent on traders. It was, by the way, not my intention to promote our company here, but Hey, if you would like to learn more about it, you should check our website. It's interesting, by the way, that Anglo-Saxon cultures like the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada and New Zealand tend to fall in the application first reasoning part. So this is the end of the first part of the video. I hope you liked it so far. See you in the next one.